Saturday, since Walter Potter's taxidermy tableau of the death and burial of Cock Robin made an appearance in the show this week, we thought we would share our episode on him for today's Saturday Classic. This episode originally came out on February 13th, 2013, and it came out when we were transitioning onto the show as hosts, so it is hosted by me and previous host Sarah Dowdy. And just as a heads up, in case it is not obvious from the mention of taxidermy, this episode includes various references to the deaths of small animals. Welcome to Stuff You Missed in History Class, a production of iHeartRadio. Hello and welcome to the podcast. I'm Holly Fry. And I'm Sarah Dowdy. And do you know, Miss Sarah, do you recall your first exposure to our topic today? Taxidermy. Well, I was going to save this story a little bit, but I'm going to bring it out now. All right. I was telling it to you already this morning. I'm pretty sure at the uh, Atlanta's capital, Georgia State Capitol here Mm. in Atlanta, Lovely building, gold dome. Anybody who's been to Atlanta has probably noticed it. driven up 85. You've seen it. If you grow up in Atlanta, you go there on many a field trip. And the most memorable memorable part, at least for me and for I think most of my classmates, was not the trips to the, you know, see the legislators or any of that. What? You weren't excited (laughs) about government inaction? (laughs) It was the museum, the little Capitol Museum, yes. which featured lots of strange Georgia history, but also most memorably a two-headed calf Sweet. and a two-headed snake. Welcome and, to Georgia, visitors. Yeah, yeah. And, <laughs> and I I said this to you this morning, but I went there sort of on a whim just a few years ago, so as an adult. And I noticed that those two items were not as prominently displayed as they used to be. They almost seemed to be displayed just as like a nod. We know people really liked these. We have to keep them out. Yeah. But they're kind of weird and maybe don't exactly belong in the state capitol. Yeah. So that's my answer. That's my. Those are the first clear memories of taxidermy. Mine I have. would have been familial because I, both of my parents are from farm families that hunted. So I know there were some deer head. And I vaguely remember being at my grandparents' house and being fairly transfixed by one particular buck that I had that simultaneously, oh, this is really neat and interesting. And oh, that's Poor a deer. He was just looking for a meal and you shot him. Bambi's dad. Yeah. Uh, but I do remember being fascinated and like questioning my father relentlessly about how did they, why, who thought this was a good idea? What do you, they just, how? Like I was completely... <laughs> Uh, simultaneously horrified and just fascinated like why does this exist yeah why do we do it and then later in my life i was exposed to the work of the taxidermist we're talking about today who anyone who is into taxidermy i am confident will know this person the second we say his name and it is walter potter and i got exposed to his work when i was working in a library and a book that featured one of his pieces came across my desk and i remember looking at it and then looking at it again and looking at it about 17 more times in the next 12 minutes and being like did somebody really put this together <laughs> uh because he did these amazing wondrously bizarre tableau with animals. And this is where people do need to stop for a minute. And if you're on your run, okay, we'll come back to it later. We'll describe a few things, but you're going to want the visual look, for yourself. Look up this stuff for sure. I know that it makes you wish that it was a, a video podcast at a time like this. Yes. But um, check out these because we'll, we'll do our best <laughs> to describe them, but you really need – the pictures. Yeah. And there's some great pictures, fortunately, too, like modern color yeah. pictures. And we'll talk about kind of where his work is now, um, like where the physical works exist now. Um, but we'll start at the beginning. So he was born in Sussex um, in 1835, and he worked at his family's inn, which was called the White Lion. Now it's called the Castle, uh, and it's in Bramber. And I have never – I've read several biographical accounts about him. No one ever really talks about his early childhood. I presume it was probably pretty standard and – Kid stuff. You know, kid stuff, working in the family um, in. But then at uh, approximately age 15, 
he, I'm presuming, because no one ever spells this out either, I'm presuming that his pet canary passed <laughs> before he had the idea to preserve it. Um Let's hope so. Yeah. It was a memento almost. Yeah. And uh, this was at a time when preserving your pets was starting to become more popular anyway. So it it was not necessarily a thing, an idea he would have just magically had on his own. He may have seen something about it or read something about it. Not the sign of a disturbed teenage boy. No, a, no, a no. normal thing to do. No, no, no. He didn't do it that well, though. No, apparently that first effort was... Um, not so hot, which anytime someone's learning a new craft or trade, usually the first go is not going to be a masterpiece. There has been some discussion, but there's never been any corroboration that he might have been influenced by an exhibit that was at the Great Exhibition in London in 1851 by Armand Pluquet. And anyone feel free to correct me if I mispronounce that. Uh, but he had an exhibit that was small animal taxidermy. Um, and it was... Um, Basically, the story of Renneke the Fox, which is based on the Wilhelm von Kalbach etchings of Goethe's medieval trickster tale. So it was kind of like a uh, – it's these – if you've never seen that one, it's these hilarious little rodents that are acting out these adventures. And they're kind of like two – it's like a pair that are doing – one activity after another, like almost like a comic Little strip. Animal tableau. Yeah. So it's not one big tableau that tells the story. It's it's laid out like sequential art. Okay. Uh, I like I like the idea that he would have been inspired by the Great Exhibition too. Yeah. Um, so many of the subjects we've discussed in the past, including Dublina's last episode, there was some toilet inspiration <laughs> that came from the Great Exhibition. This is an exciting time in London. <laughs> That's what I know. <laughs> it is this sort of cultural point where where all – People are exposed to new things for the first time, and it yeah. certainly seems plausible that this young boy from a country village would come across something that he found really magical at yeah. the Great Exhibition. Well, and even, like I said, there have not been any corroborative writings that say definitively, yes, he was there. But the Great Exhibition was so big that people were talking about the things that they had seen. And it traveled, yeah, you know, via even gossip and word of mouth. So, uh, so, yeah, he did his canary. And there's a, a great um, quote that he gave, apparently in uh, 1895, he did a, a correspondence interview with the Idler magazine. And he says, well, after I'd done my canary, people encouraged me to persevere. <laughs> if they saw any <laughs> bird or animal they thought I would like, they'd bring it or send it to me. <laughs> so he was practicing throughout these years after he was 15, because he did take a shine to this craft. And then he got the idea that he could put them together in big works of art. And that's kind of the turning point here, not just mounting an animal and displaying it uniquely. Right. Creating some scene with it. Yeah, it really became almost like a painter with a paintbrush. He would create entire vistas and stories using mounted animals. Um, and the first big one is the history of Cock Robin, which uh, he used... 98 birds, I believe, that he had been working on through the years. And this is when he was uh, 19. He had gotten all of those together. And he worked on the history of – or the original death and burial. I'm sorry. It wasn't the history. Um, it was the original death and burial of Cock Robin. And – he worked on this for years and years, but it basically was a big funeral procession for Cock Robin, including the, um, I believe it was a sparrow that had shot him with an arrow. With my bow and arrow. Yeah. And there was an owl grave digger and, you know, the grave is there and there are other animals there to pay their respects. It's like a big story. Yeah. Inspired by the nursery rhyme, yes. too. Um, where all of the birds are picking their roles, the, yeah. the role they'll perform during Cock Robin's funeral. Yes. Um, and, and that's the other major difference here. So putting the animals together in a tableau, but not in an animal-like way. It's not no. a natural history museum setting. It's a human-like setting. <laughs> yeah. These aren't uh, – later on, he starts to add even more human accessories to it. These aren't like – clothed yet. There are a couple with ribbons around their necks. Um, and the owl clearly is holding a, a, a little shovel, a little shovel <laughs> where, that he's digging the grave with. But yeah, this is really, you know, as Sarah said, the first time that it was 
mounted animals doing human things, almost like you would see in like a children's book or a cartoon. Yeah, the, the nursery rhyme inspiration is, yeah, is, is very real. apparent, and it carries through his work pretty much his entire life. Uh, so at that point, as his uh, work started to expand, they had to expand his work area. So he first moved into a barn loft at his family's house. Uh, and then once he started creating these big works, they went on display at the inn. Uh, and there have been different accounts of where they went on display and what the purpose was. And I think it's kind of a case of revisionist history. Mm -hmm. Uh, It sounds like his parents were very encouraging of his work because I'm sure they saw it as a potential career. Um, And he says in that same interview with the idler that uh, his father um, eventually built, does he call it a tea shed? I think behind the inn where he could put his his big work on display. And of course, then his work continued to grow and grow and grow. Well, and he describes the little girls about his age, you know, teenage girls. Yeah. Coming to to see the see his work for the first time. Yeah. And, and leaving some coins behind and starting to get that idea, oh wait, maybe I I can make money. Yeah, with that's this. where he got his idea for uh, a museum. Well, and as you were mentioning, too, with other accounts you see of this, I mean, some are saying it was a direct marketing strategy. Right, that his parents were like, come and see the inn where we have... Have a pint. Animal tableau. Check out the death of Cock Robin. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, but others are more like, oh, it kind of happened accidentally. I, I, can, I can see it either way. I mean, we were saying earlier, yeah. I think I would go slightly out of my way to visit an inn or a pub that had these strange scenes, especially since they were pretty trendy at the time. Yeah. Um, Or just, you know, you happen upon them. It has nothing to do with marketing the pub. Yeah. So eventually, um, in 1866, he moved his workshop to a new spot because the stable loft was not containing his situation anymore. And then again, in 1880, he moved into a specially built building, which eventually became his museum. And that museum wasn't only for his work. He also collected uh, curiosities from other places, um, including like a lot of it was natural history type items like horns and teeth. There were skulls and he had some human artifacts like his shoes and jewelry, uh, just sort of a random collection, a hodgepodge of things. This part of of the story reminded me so much of uh, P.T. Barnum's story. Yeah. And the the era before him of of natural history museums, I guess the birth of natural history museums mm-hmm. and going from these collections, uh, curios, yeah. <laughs> just a strange hodgepodge of things, some valuable, some just old teeth or, <laughs> or horns or, or whatnot, all brought together and, and the fad for, for seeing those at the time yeah. too. Yeah, I mean, people were very fascinated by this idea of just looking at things from other people's lives or other animals that they maybe hadn't been exposed to in their natural day-to-day life. Um, that It was, as you said, like this was really when the idea of the Natural History Museum was starting to kind of boom and grow. And um, the Natural History Museum and the Freak Show Museum. Yeah, I mean, it was all kind of two ha- different paths. People were looking for entertainment in a variety of ways at the same time. Mm-hmm. Um, and he did start taking on work as – um, a taxidermist, like, on demand for people. Like, he would preserve their pets for them. Um, it was very, it was starting to get very popular for people to keep uh, mounted animals in their parlors. Um, some would be, like, their personal family pets, but some also collected, like, exotic birds. Apparently, um, Queen Victoria had some exotic birds, which is a thing I had not known until we were digging in on research for this. Um So he would do all of that, but really he always wanted to continue creating these tableau. And a question that always comes up whenever you're talking about Walter Potter with people is, where was he getting these animals? Yeah, once Um, you start seeing tableau with 20 kittens in them, (laughs) the thought will cross your mind. Yeah, so apparently uh, he mentioned in that that interview that I cited earlier that people would bring him what they thought were interesting specimens. But he also kind of had a deal going on with local farmers. And this is where our modern pet-loving 
brain has to kind of close down and be put aside for a little while because I have a hard time with this being like a crazy animal person. Um, you know, on farms, they don't always spay and neuter their pets and cats are there to work. They're there to keep vermin at bay. But because they are animals that have not been fixed, they are having lots of babies and often way more than really can be sustained by what the rodent population on the farm is. So farmers would bring him unwanted kittens. I have not really found a clear indicator as to whether they were already deceased when they got to Mr. Potter or if he took care of that. Um, But I I do know, like I said, I grew up with some um, farm family background for, you know, people that grow up in that, it's often not, and especially at this period of time, it wasn't like you went to the vet and had animals euthanized. You kind of learned to do the dirty work and make the hard decision of taking care of situations like that. Well, and, and the history of the animals seemed to become kind of an issue, too, in the 1970s with the museum and, and yeah. visitors concerned that it was cruelty to animals. So much right. so that museum had to put up a little placard yeah. saying, for one thing, these are over 100 years old. Yeah. And also, don't worry, no animals were specifically killed for this right. project. Which right. I don't they, know if you They could... would have been done away with one way or the other. Yeah. This way, they just went on to become part of art. Still, though, it's hard not to it's think about. It's troubling. It is. I mean, I as I said, I have to kind of put away my my animal loving brain for a moment and just think about, you know, the time period and and how animals, you know, were seen more as livestock at that point. It wasn't mm-hmm. like their cuddly pet. It was they were working creatures. But also people would bring him um malformed unfortunate yeah. specimens that had maybe not lived very long because they were not healthy. Maybe one's more in line with my two headed snake, two headed exactly. calf experience. Um we mentioned earlier you can find all manner of images of these things if you look. And some of them like some of the more malformed ones, they're uh, it's just like the kitten with eight legs and two tails, which is what it's called. It's very basic. Um, kitten with eight legs and – yeah, kitten with eight legs and two tails. There's one that has t- – there are a couple that have like two faces. There are, um, you know – There's ch- a duckling chickens. with four legs yeah. and four wings. So and- he did those kind of out of fascination, and I think he was probably studying anatomy at the same time. You know what I mean? It was giving mm-hmm. him – some clues into how the differences between right and wrong create the structure properly. Uh, But then he was also doing really artistic works like the village school, which is a bunch of tiny bunnies with little chalkboards (laughs) and they have little desks and he would craft all of their accessories as well. So their tiny little lesson books, all of that was handmade. Um, The guinea pigs cricket match. That one has always cracked me up. There is a full guinea pig band with brass multi piece. Yeah, they are yeah. <laughs> they are full on ready to play orchestral uh, pieces. There's a pavilion, and then there are the guinea pigs who are getting ready for their cricket match. And another thing to point out about these tableau too is they all have these beautifully soft painted backgrounds. Yeah, uh, which seem. So striking against the, by this point, kind of dusty Victorian yeah. animals. Um, but they add to that nursery rhyme, fairy tale quality it was trying to go for. For sure. Uh, there's one really odd one that is a, uh, when we first started talking about doing this episode, I was like, Sarah, you have to see this picture. <laughs> and it's a monkey riding a goat. <laughs> and I don't know why every time I look at it, it makes me kind of chuckle because the expression on the monkey's face is funny. The whole setup is funny. The proportion of it is just perfectly hilarious. That one seemed so reminiscent of Barnum to yeah. me. Because, you know, and you can give this to Potter, too. He was not trying to um, pull one over on his audience. No. Uh, it was, you know, this is a this is a kitten who was born with two heads or, or whatnot. Right. Not he wasn't trying not to create creatures that didn't exist. The he wasn't, monkey riding on the goat was not just a monkey found riding in on nature. <laughs> yeah, just a strange decision to yeah. uh, combine two animals into into one scene like this. And then the big one that um, I think for people that are fans of his work, and it is very striking. There's one called the kitten's wedding, and it is a full wedding party comprised of kittens in full gowns, elaborate dresses and jewelry, and little suits. It's it's fascinating and bizarre, and there's a grotesque element to it. But it's also one of those things where I 
can't help but think like about the hours of meticulous exacting labor that goes into something like this. I mean, he made teeny tiny costumes to put mm-hmm. on each of them and they're all quaffed like their hair is done. They're, it's it's really quite uh, fascinating to think about how much just he must have been in love with his art mm-hmm. because he really did seem to just dedicate his heart and soul to it. It's easy to focus solely on the mounts though. Yeah. <laughs> and and not look at not look at the kittens dresses but look at that their it faces doesn't look quite yeah. right. You know, I, I think um probably the goal of of many taxidermists today and we've heard from we have listeners too who've written in to tell us about their work. Yeah. Um tell us that it's not stuffing, it's mounting. mounting. Um, I think maybe of the modern goal of taxidermy is to look as though the animal were once alive. Right. (laughs) Um, To have... It's the idea of capturing a natural moment for them. Have a living quality about them. And you certainly cannot say that about Potter's work. And I don't think that was the goal, but his taxidermy skills wouldn't have allowed that anyway. I mean, the, the kittens don't have... They don't look like they were ever alive. No, they look like dolls. Mm -hmm. They really do have a doll-like quality by the time he is done humanizing them, you know, anthropomorphizing them with outfits and accessories and just concepts that they would not be put into. Like, you know, very few kittens get invited to weddings in my experience, but (laughs) (laughs) some once in a while it happens. Um, But yeah, it's not, it's not trying to capture that moment of the animal in the wild. Some of his, um, malformed creatures are more intended to look like their lifelike state. Yeah. Um, But these ones, once he gets into Tableau, it's really about creating something entirely new. Some of the lifelike quality or lack thereof, too, comes from his skill mounting, too. I mean, things didn't always go quite as planned, yeah. especially for more exotic animals. Yeah, because he didn't have practice. He didn't get to practice with them. He mm-hmm. got pretty good at kittens and apparently was very good with birds. Mm-hmm. Uh, but there is allegedly a baby giraffe that he attempted that I could never find a photo for that just didn't come out quite right. <laughs> um, and then <laughs> the lion that looks like it's wearing um, saggy pantyhose because his the skin on the legs you know it's with any anyone who's been around a cat you know that the skin has some flexibility but he didn't quite get where it all it's sat drapey. properly it's, it's like a stockings. little drapey. yeah it looks <laughs> and, and just the the stance of the lion too it's one of those where okay maybe he didn't ever see a living lion yeah maybe he didn't have that opportunity because the lion doesn't stand quite like that. Yeah, it looks just off. I mean, you can recognize it as a lion. There is a certain, you know, it's a lion, so there's a certain natural majesty to it, but you just, something's not quite right. That reminds me of of old engravings of, uh, you know, explorers who have described animals, and then they're illustrated by engravers back in in Europe, and these are uh, African animals or North American animals, and the illustrator has never seen them, and they're trying to imagine what the animal looks like. Yeah. And it's just not quite right. A plus effort. <laughs> <laughs> um, and he, he continued to mount his entire life. And then in 1914, he suffered a stroke and he never really fully recovered. And he was, I believe, 79 at the time. So it wasn't like he was struck down as a very young man. Um But then in 1918, he passed away, and he had spent his whole life there in Sussex, basically. He was buried in the village churchyard, um, and his museum was left to his daughter, Minnie Collins, and his grandson, also named Walter, but his last name was Collins. uh, And they were the curators of the museum until the 1970s. And they basically got to a point where, you know, they just couldn't handle it anymore. It was too much work. I mean, that's a lot to keep going. And so um, it got moved first to Arendelle. And then in the 1980s, it went to the Jamaica Inn in Cornwall. There was a moment in the middle where it was almost going to be shipped off to America because I think that first stopping point also didn't quite know what to do with it and didn't have the resources to keep it in good condition. And then the Jamaica Inn stepped in and said, no, no, we will take it. So Those people hung on to it until 
2003. And they decided to liquidate the collection because their curator had died or had retired, rather, I'm sorry. And their taxidermist had passed away. He had leukemia. And they... Who had maintained all of these specimens, too. And uh, and it's like 10,000 specimens by that point. And it would be a lot of work, too. It's not something that you can just put in a case and then forget about. No, it needs constant care and maintenance. Uh, especially, you know, as it gets older, it is more and more work. You sent me a video from the 1960s yeah. <laughs> where there's a man who is tending to to some of the specimens, I think, to a cow in one of the pictures, which yeah. is it, 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 he didn't preserve a life-size cow. It's a, a he model. He bought a model and then covered, covered it, with it with calf skin. skin. Yeah. Uh, but the, the curator is carefully dusting and cleaning and then returns the cow to the tableau. It would be a tremendous amount of work. And also, I, I can see why the museums would be facing problems in this time, too, because this is kind of kitschy at <laughs> this yeah, point, and 1970s while it, onward. It was very popular in the Victorian era to go look at mounted animals, and they found it quite charming. There was a growing um, sense of unrest at it. Like, there wasn't the same, oh, that's magical and charming. It was They saw more of the grotesque than the charm the at that point. kind of macabre. And yeah. uh, like we mentioned earlier, the questions about, wait a minute, is this humane or not? Okay, right. they were all killed 100 years ago. Right. But, um, <laughs> yeah, certain changing tastes <laughs> played a role in this. Yeah. So, uh, and it was a Mr. and Mrs. Watts that owned the collection at this point. So in 2003, they decided that they would sell the collection and they were hoping that someone would buy the whole thing in one shot and maintain the museum. Because even though it had shifted and was not in the original museum, they still considered it the museum. A complete collection. Um, and unfortunately, that did not happen. I mean, there were many attempts made. There was even a landowner nearby that was offering a parcel for free and saying, you can build a new museum here if you can keep the collection together. But they still needed capital to do all of that. And it never came through. And it it's pretty... Interesting, the numbers, when you look at the prices some of these pieces fetched, and then we'll come back to sort of some other things that developed or came to light after the fact. There was a little bit of scandal. Uh, And there were, as I said, there were lots of people trying to get together the money to put this thing, to keep it together and to buy the whole collection outright, but they just never, there was never enough. And so eventually... For example, the death and burial of Cock Robin, uh, the original estimate for what it was going to go for was $10,000. And I think it actually went for 23,500 British pounds, which is about $33,000. Uh, U.S. at the time of the sale. And that was the high high mark for, for the works, but a lot of them... Were, Kitten's Wedding, actually, Kitten's was a wedding, little bit more. A little more. Yeah, that was uh, $35,000. Yeah. Uh, but a lot of them were pulling in in the, in the 20s, um, 11,000, 10,000 monkey, <laughs> monkey riding a goat brought in $11,600. Which I think is a bargain. <laughs> But, I mean, there really were, even though this is years and years later, I mean, this is in the 2000s, there were enough people that knew about his work that were very excited to go. And you can read some accounts online of people that were like, okay, I have, you know, I'm throwing out a random number, like $10,000. I'm going to get whatever I can because I really want a piece of Walter Potter's legacy. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the crazy thing is, though, even though these uh, works went for way more than expected and ultimately pulled in around 529,900 pounds, which, as you said, was twice what they had predicted, the scandal came because there had apparently been an offer to keep the collection together. And that offer had been for way more than that collective price. A million pounds. Right. Uh, And that was from an artist, a British artist named Damien Hirst. Uh, And he really uh, wanted it. I mean, he's a fan of uh, Walter Potter. He knew about his work. He's best known, too, by the way, for the the shark suspended in 
tank. When it came to light that he had actually made an offer to Bonhams, which was the auction house that handled the sale, the Watts were actually really upset because they had never been informed of this offer. As of 2007, they were threatening to sue Bonhams for not accepting that offer and for not informing them. Because they were supposed to have notified them if they received any serious offer to right. keep the collection intact. Right. And let so- alone one that was so high above what they actually pulled Yeah, in. so they were planning to sue both for monetary damages for um, half a million pounds, but also they really did. I mean, these are people that actually tended this collection for years. It's not mm-hmm. like they just were trying to turn it and make a buck. You know, they clearly cared about it and wanted it to go in one big set, not piecemeal. It ended up in 691 different lots and which was, I'm sure, heartbreaking to people that had tended to it very lovingly for, you know, decades at that point. So as it stands, Mr. Watts has taken it to court and he said, we have tried to discuss this amicably, but with no joy, they leave us with no option to, but to pursue our complaint in the court. So that seems to be ongoing. It was a no recent update on it. Yeah, I didn't see one. But there is a different recent update. There is. And the collection is coming together again, although Well, it did temporarily. briefly um, in 2010. Um, Damien Hurst, again, and he did buy some of the lots, was basically kind of using his connections in the art world to try to put this together in the Museum of Everything, which is a pop-up museum uh, in Primrose Hill in London, which I apparently used to be a Victoria. It was a dairy in Victorian era, and then it became a recording studio. Good acoustics in the dairy, and then <laughs> now it's it was at least for this time a pop up museum space. And so he actually did get together a lot of the pieces, even some that had been sold to collectors overseas. I know there were some pieces that were here in the U.S. that were being shipped over for the collection, and it ran until the end of 2010, at least. I don't know if any portion of it continued um, as an exhibit, but I have a feeling this is probably not the last time we will see people try to put this together because it it's odd how lovingly people look at this collection. There's just something about it that it it makes you want to like pull for it to all come back together it, it again. It does. I mean, I, I was, um, it's interesting to look at these and it is such a, I don't know, a strange slice of Victorian life. Yeah. But the fascination that people have with it, even though this is clearly not in style <laughs> today, um, no. it is is interesting in that there are these people who are investing great deals of money in it, too, to try to reunite these pieces and bring them all back together. Yeah. It's it, – I mean, I, I when you read accounts of – people that were trying to save it during the 2003 auction. I mean, there's really like a sense, a tone of just dismay and heartbreak Heartbreak. that it's, you know, a pity. They think it's a national treasure. Why isn't, you know, some big institution stepping in and, and making sure that this, you know, full collection museum doesn't get preserved as it is. And I wonder too, how much of that comes into nostalgia too. If, if this museum was a, favorite place for generations of kids to visit, yeah. you know, through through the 70s, certainly, but beyond, too, when the Watts were maintaining it. Yeah. Um, just like I would be sad if the Capitol finally put away their two-headed snake. <laughs> Don't <laughs> let me know if you work there and it, it's gone now. Um, I wonder if, if people feel that way, too, that this is something um, strangely British <laughs> yeah. and, and worth maintaining and celebrating. It's also, there's such a sweetness to the story that it was just basically a simple kid in the country who had a love for a thing. And that was the only thing he really did his whole life. I mean, he married, he had several children, but it was his life's work was his museum and his taxidermy and, you know, mounting animals in new and creative and artistic ways that no one had ever thought to do before. Yeah. Uh, There's just, you want to cheer for those people. So, you know, you want to maintain what's left of their work when they're gone. And that he did have success in his life too, even if the collection is now going through (laughs) hard times being split up. But um, I thought one of the most interesting points was that at one point the museum was so popular that they had to extend the railway platform in town to accommodate the yeah, people that were just visitors coming, coming in. Coming out to visit. <laughs> coming to see the kitten wedding. 
<laughs> they got an invite to the kitten wedding. <laughs> they brought their gift. They're ready to be fabulous guests and have a good time. So hopefully we'll see more stories about the Potter collection. And I would love to see it myself at some point. That's like one of my bucket list items is to see at least some decent chunks of the Potter collection. Well, it sounds like Kitten Wedding is possibly in the States, too, If if because uh, Damien Hurst had had trouble getting yeah, it back to the collection. Yeah, that was one that he had difficulty getting. They mentioned it was somewhere, but I don't know if it's in a in a private collection. In somebody's house. <laughs> this, this story um, – made me sort of more interested, too, in just the history of taxidermy, too. Yeah. And, and um, you know, how it got to this extremely decorative point in the uh, late Victorian era, uh, but its earlier roots, too. And and also, I couldn't help but thinking of the health issues, too, working yeah. with the chemicals. I mean, he lives to a ripe old age. It obviously doesn't seem to have affected his health, but arsenic there's you know. <laughs> there's a lot of a lot of sludge mm-hmm. and gross chemicals that are not kind to the the body um yeah and i it, it's funny too because we love these things so much but I, I the idea of preserving a beloved pet has certainly fallen out of favor oh, yes. i mean i know there are people that still do it from time to time but they're Definitely outliers of like the the pet parent community. <laughs> I know fewer people. I don't know I don't anyone know personally. <laughs> I don't think that's done that. No, um, but I know people do it. So it is kind of a. It's an interesting lens that we can kind of flare out where we really love this, but we would be a little creeped out by our own, you know, animals being part of something like that. Well, in that game preservation is still a totally mainstream, yeah, pursuit. Um, I'm suddenly having a flash to um, the Field Museum in Chicago. Have you ever been? They have a huge taxidermy collection. I have not. I thought of the Biltmore House, the Vanderbilt Hall. Oh, yeah. Um, In their – the gentleman's room, (laughs) essentially. Uh, There is a huge collection of of game that's been mounted. Yeah. If anyone is in Chicago or is visiting Chicago, go to the field. And, I mean, it's – it blows you away just how many specimens they have on display. They even have the ghost in the darkness, the lions that were murderous, um, that there was a movie about them. They're on display there. I mean, it's just walking through museum hall after museum hall of mounted animals. It's kind of fascinating. I'm sure we're going to hear from our taxidermy. I hope. I bet they can give us all manner of insights that uh, you don't always get when you're doing regular research. There are things that you learn from the inside of any trade that you would not normally learn when you're reading about it or studying about it. So I look forward to those. Thanks so much for joining us on this Saturday. Since this episode is out of the archive, if you heard an email address or a Facebook URL or something similar over the course of the show, that could be obsolete now. Our current email address is historypodcast at iheartradio.com. Our old How Stuff Works email address no longer works. You can find us all over social media at Missed in History. And you can subscribe to our show on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, the iHeartRadio app, and wherever else you listen to podcasts. Stuff You Missed in History Class is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.